Hello. Nice to see you back <laughs> on the programme. Thank you. First, we're going to see him in character. That was always the last thing I heard him say at night before he retired to bed. He had what I consider to be a fine mind, a poetic mind. And his thoughts respecting his property never come on him so strong as when he was sitting upon a barrel and he had the hand turned. All of the vibrations had run through him for a little while. He would screech, Tommy! I feel my property coming on me! Blind away! I shall be a man of fortune! I feel the mint a jingling in me, Tommy! I was swelling out into the Bank of England! Such is the effect of music on a poetic mind. Not that he was partial to any music, but a barrel organ. On the contrary, he hated it. Simon as Mr Chops. You've lost the chops. Oh, yes, uh, I'm not actually as Mr Chops. Uh, the piece is about Mr Chops, who's mm. a dwarf, mm -hmm. and the man I play is Magsman, who's a showman. And Mr Chops is his favourite performer. And Mr Chops wins the lottery. And he goes into society, he wins a huge amount of money. And he's made an absolute star of. And of course, when his money runs out, they kick him out again. It's a very salutary tale for now, for today. It's yes. very, I mean, he might just as well be on Britain's Got Talent. But. <laughs> <laughs> and your love affair with Dickens, because you, you, you clearly, you know, masses about it and you perform many times yeah. his work. What, what, what first, when you first become... Well, um, I, I had chicken pox as a child, and you know what a revolting thing that is. You scratch, you can't sleep, you're miserable. And my grandmother placed a copy of the Pickwick Papers in my hand, and I never scratched again, you know. I mean, I, I just fell in love with the world of Dickens, his exuberance, his, uh, obviously, the comedy, his sense of human life, it was mm. so reaffirming, you know. And uh, so I never really fell out of love. And when I became an actor, I, I played Scrooge in Christmas Carol and Bob Cratchit, and then I played Micawber on the television. And the great moment for me was when I was asked to reconstruct his public readings, because um, as probably most people know now, he, for the last three or four years of his life, read from his own novels uh, to huge crowds. I mean, they were, these were like rock concerts, these events, because he was the most famous man of his age. And one of the things that he read was Mr. Chops, and another one was Dr. Marigold, and these were short stories that he turned into plays. Even the, even the, the, the short stories have these cliffhangers, yeah. because, because it was pamphlets, a lot of what he, he did was in pamphlet form. Yeah. You used to have to have a cliffhanger on the end, uh, so somebody yes, could go yes. and buy it the following day. That's right, he wrote absolutely, in series. Uh, um, and, uh, but uh, th these are really interesting, these stories, because he, he was the editor of a magazine, which he'd founded, called All the Year Round. Mm. And he would write uh, um, uh, 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 the first episode, and then Mrs. Gaskell would write the second, and Wilkie Collins would write really? the third, and then Mark Lemon would write the fourth, and then he'd come in again and write the fifth, or, you know, the, the same thing in a different pattern. And it was those, the pieces that he'd written, the bits that he'd written that he performed. And this became, mm. Dr. Marigold became the most popular of all his readings uh, after A Christmas Carol, which was, of course, the most popular. But it, cl I mean, it clearly really matters to you that people, you know, find Dickens as interesting as you do. And I understand you, you played Dickens in Doctor Who. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're going to see a clip of that oh, now, great. sort of oh, bringing it right up to date. You're shaking your head already. Let's no, go. No, I love it. it. I love it. <laughs> oh, you! Follow that hearse! Not, sir. Why not? Tell you why not. I'll give you a very good reason why not, because this is my coach. Well, get in, then. Come on, you're losing them. Everything in order, Mr Dickens? No, it is not. What did he say? Uh, let me say this first. I'm not without a sense of humour. Dickens? But... Yes. Charles Dickens? Yes. The Charles Dickens? Should I remove the gentleman, sir? Charles Dickens, you're brilliant, you are. Completely, 100% brilliant. Have it them all. Great expectations, Oliver Twist, and what's the other one? The, the, the one with the ghost? Christmas Carol? No, 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 the one with the trains, the signalman, that's it, terrifying. The best short story ever written. You're a genius. You want me to get rid of him, sir? Uh, no, I think he can stay. Honestly, Charles, uh, can I call you Charles? I'm such a big fan. Uh, uh, you, uh, what? Big what? Fan. Number one fan, that's me. How exactly are you a fan? In what way do you resemble a means of keeping oneself cool? No, it means fanatic, devoted to. Mind you, I've got to say, that American bait Martin Chuzzlewit, what's that about? Oh, I know, that was dull. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do that at university. Uh, you're not just um, an expert on Dickens. Orson Welles is another. 
Well, I've been writing about autumn for yes. 20 years now. 20 uh, years. I, I started writing in yeah, 89. Um, uh, and uh, it, what was supposed to be just a little book about Orson Welles' theatre turned into a three-volume life of the man because he's so vast, so extraordinary, so complex uh, uh, that uh, it, nothing less would do to do justice to him. I'm just starting on the third volume and have just made a documentary about him for, uh, uh, for the BBC, in fact, uh, about his time in Europe, which not many people have kind of taken on board because for mm. many people, Orson Welles means Citizen Kane yes. and then cherry commercials, and that's sort of nothing <laughs> in between, and, uh, which is ridiculous because he's one of the greatest filmmakers of the 20th century, and uh, especially the work he did in Europe, including Othello, for example, Chimes at Midnight, which is his film about Falstaff, and a gloriously funny little film called F for fake are among the wittiest things of the 20th century. Can I ask you about the actor and his voice? You know, we were talking to Stuart Hall a moment yeah, yeah. ago, and he <laughs> has this amazing delivery, which he has made a career out of. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to picture Simon Callow. When did the kind of the big <laughs> voice and the delivery, when did that emerge? Or what are you, what, were you well, like when you were 16? No, I think there are sort of a, a series of things. One is I went to live in Africa when I was nine. and in, in uh, what's now Zambia, was northern Rhodesia, and there was this big decision as to whether I would adopt the, you know, South African kind of northern Rhodesian accent or whether I'd stick with my own. So I became more English and sort of orated, and they used to say, oh, listen to this little boy, he's talking so beautifully, God. So I got a, a, bit, of a, a bit of a celebrity for my voice. <laughs> then later, when I was at school, there was no school drama of any kind. I never acted in anything at all until I went to, to university. But uh, I was the cox of the rowing eight. And that's, I can't think of a better uh, vocal training than so that. So bigger and yes. bigger. Exactly. It all comes from uh, here. Well, yeah, it, it has Does to, it? yes. Well, pretty well. You need a lot of support and yeah. all of that. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, and I've played in very, very big theatres and mm. so on. So it just, you just develop your voice. And some actors hate being reminded of things that people know them most for. But that scene in Four Weddings and a Funeral, I, there, you, you must be reminded of that all the time. Well, I, I, I'm always congratulated on the funeral in Four Weddings and a Funeral, and I point out that I'm not there. <laughs> it's actually uh, um, it's John Hanna, who rather wonderfully orates over me, over my dead body, as it were. Yes. But uh, I, I adore that filmmaking. It was fantastic. Although, in fact, the day I died was very depressing. It's a strange thing as an actor. If you know you're going to die, you wake up in the morning thinking, I'm going to die today. It kind of gets you down rather. I felt much better after I'd died mm. uh, because actually then we went back to shoot scenes before I'd died. And John Hannah <laughs> did such a good job as well, Fantastic. didn't he? Such a good job.